This is Chapter Twenty Eight of A Tramp Abroad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Tramp Abroad by Mark Twain. Chapter Twenty Eight: The Yodel and Its Native Wilds. The Rigi Kulm is an imposing alpine mass six thousand feet high, which stands by itself and commands a mighty prospect of blue lakes, green valleys, and snowy mountains a compact and magnificent picture three hundred miles in circumference the ascent is made by rail or horseback or on foot as one may prefer i and my agent panoplied ourselves in walking costume one bright morning and started down the lake on the steamboat we got ashore at the village of vegas three-quarters of an hour distant from lucerne this village is at the foot of the mountain we were soon tramping leisurely up the leafy mule-path, and then the talk began to flow, as usual. It was twelve o'clock noon, and a breezy, cloudless day. The ascent was gradual, and the glimpses, from under the curtaining boughs, of blue water and tiny sailboats and beetling cliffs, were as charming as glimpses of dreamland. All the circumstances were perfect, and the anticipations, too for we should soon be enjoying for the first time that wonderful spectacle, an alpine sunrise, the object of our journey. There was, apparently, no real need for hurry, for the guide-book made the walking distance from Vegas to the summit only three hours and a quarter. I say, apparently, because the guide-book had already fooled us once, about the distance from Allerheiligen to Oppenau, and for aught I knew it might be getting ready to fool us again. We were only certain as to the altitudes. We calculated to find out for ourselves how many hours it is from the bottom to the top. The summit is six thousand feet above the sea, but only forty-five hundred feet above the lake. When we had walked half an hour, we were fairly into the swing and humor of the undertaking, so we cleared for action. That is to say, we got a boy whom we met to carry our alpenstocks and satchels and overcoats and things for us. That left us free for business. I suppose we must have stopped oftener to stretch out on the grass in the shade and take a bit of a smoke than this boy was used to, for presently he asked if it had been our idea to hire him by the job or by the year. We told him he could move along if he was in a hurry. He said he wasn't in such a very particular hurry, but he wanted to get to the top while he was young. We told him to clear out, then, and leave the things at the uppermost hotel, and say we should be along presently. He said he would secure us a hotel if he could, but if they were all full he would ask them to build another one and hurry up and get the paint and plaster dry against we arrived. Still gently chafing us, he pushed ahead up the trail and soon disappeared. By six o'clock we were pretty high up in the air, and the view of lake and mountains had greatly grown in breadth and interest. We halted a while at a little public house where we had bread and cheese and a quart or two of fresh milk out on the porch, with the big panorama all before us, and then moved on again. Ten minutes afterward we met a hot, red-faced man plunging down the mountain, making mighty strides, swinging his alpenstock ahead of him, and taking a grip on the ground with its iron point to support these big strides. He stopped, fanned himself with his hat, swabbed the perspiration from his face and neck with a red handkerchief, panted a moment or two, and asked how far to Vegas. I said three hours. He looked surprised, and said, "'Why, it seems as if I could toss a biscuit into the lake from here. It's so close by. Is that an inn there?' I said it was. "'Well,' said he, "'I can't stand another three hours. I've had enough today. I'll take a bed there.' I asked, "'Are we nearly to the top?' "'Nearly to the top? Why, bless your soul, you haven't really started yet.' I said we would put up at the inn, too. So we turned back and ordered a hot supper, and had a quite jolly evening of it with this Englishman. The German landlady gave us neat rooms and nice beds, and when I and my agent turned in, it was with the resolution to be up early and make the utmost of our first alpine sunrise. But, of course, we were dead tired and slept like policemen. So when we woke in the morning and ran to the window it was already too late, because it was half-past eleven. It was a sharp disappointment. However, we ordered breakfast and told the landlady to call the Englishman, but she said he was already up and off at daybreak, and swearing like mad about something or other. We could not find out what the matter was. He had asked the landlady the altitude of her place above the level of the lake, 
and she told him fourteen hundred and ninety-five feet. That was all that was said. Then he lost his temper. He said that between <coughs> fools and guide-books a man could acquire ignorance enough in twenty-four hours in a country like this to last him a year. Harris believed our boy had been loading him up with misinformation, and this was probably the case, for his epithet described that boy to a dot. We got under way about the turn of noon, and pulled out for the summit again, with a fresh and vigorous step. When we had gone about two hundred yards, and stopped to rest, I glanced to the left while I was lighting my pipe, and in the distance detected a long worm of black smoke crawling lazily up the steep mountain. Of course, that was the locomotive. We propped ourselves on our elbows at once to gaze, for we had never seen a mountain railway yet. Presently we could make out the train. It seemed incredible that that thing should creep straight up a sharp slant like the roof of a house, but there it was, and it was doing that very miracle. In the course of a couple of hours we reached a fine breezy altitude where the little shepherd huts had big stones all over their roofs to hold them down to the earth when the great storms rage. The country was wild and rocky about here, but there were plenty of trees, plenty of moss, and grass. Away off on the opposite shore of the lake we could see some villages, and now for the first time we could observe the real difference between their proportions and those of the giant mountains at whose feet they slept. When one is in one of those villages it seems spacious, and its houses seem high, and not out of proportion to the mountain that overhangs them. But from our altitude what a change! The mountains were bigger and grander than ever, as they stood there thinking their solemn thoughts with their heads in the drifting clouds. But the villages at their feet, when the painstaking eye could trace them up and find them, were so reduced, almost invisible, and lay so flat against the ground, that the exactest simile I can devise is to compare them to ant deposits of granulated dirt overshadowed by the huge bulk of a cathedral. The steamboats skimming along under the stupendous precipices were diminished by distance to the daintiest little toys, the sailboats and rowboats to shallops proper for fairies that keep house in the cups of lilies and ride to court on the backs of bumblebees. Presently we came upon half a dozen sheep nibbling grass in the spray of a stream of clear water that sprang from a rock wall a hundred feet high and all at once our ears were startled with a melodious peeling joyously from a near but invisible source, and recognized that we were hearing for the first time the famous alpine yodel in its own native wilds. And we recognized also that it was that sort of quaint commingling of baritone and falsetto which at home we call Tyrolese warbling. The yodeling, pronounced Yodling, emphasis on the O, continued, and was very pleasant and inspiring to hear. Now the yodeler appeared, a shepherd boy of sixteen, and in our gladness and gratitude we gave him a franc to yodel some more. So he yodeled, and we listened. We moved on presently, and he generously yodeled us out of sight. After about fifteen minutes we came across another shepherd boy who was yodeling, and gave him half a franc to keep it up. He also yodeled us out of sight. After that we found a yodeler every ten minutes. We gave the first one eight cents, the second one six cents, the third one four, the fourth one a penny, contributed nothing to numbers five, six, and seven, and during the remainder of the day hired the rest of the yodelers at a franc apiece not to yodel any more. There is somewhat too much of the yodeling in the Alps. About the middle of the afternoon we passed through a prodigious natural gateway called the Felsenter formed by two enormous upright rocks, with a third lying across the top. There was a very attractive little hotel close by, but our energies were not conquered yet, so we went on. Three hours afterward we came to the railway track. It was planted straight up the mountain with the slant of a ladder that leans against a house, and it seemed to us that man would need good nerves who proposed to travel up it or down it either. During the latter part of the afternoon we cooled our roasting interiors with ice-cold water from clear streams. The only really satisfying water we had tasted since we left home, for at the hotels on the continent they merely give you a tumbler of ice to soak your water in, and that only modifies its hotness, doesn't make it cold. 
water can only be made cold enough for summer comfort by being prepared in a refrigerator or a closed ice pitcher. Europeans say ice water impairs digestion. How do they know? They never drink any. At ten minutes past six we reached the Kaltbad station, where there is a spacious hotel with great verandas which command a majestic expanse of lake and mountain scenery. We were pretty fagged out now, but as we did not wish to miss the alpine sunrise, we got through our dinner as quickly as possible and hurried off to bed. It was unspeakably comfortable to stretch our weary limbs between the cool, damp sheets. And how we did sleep! for there is no opiate like alpine pedestrianism. In the morning we both awoke and leapt out of bed at the same instant, and ran and stripped aside the window-curtains. But we suffered a bitter disappointment again. It was already half-past three in the afternoon. We dressed sullenly and in ill spirits, each accusing the other of oversleeping. Harris said, if we had brought the courier along, as we ought to have done, we should not have missed these sunrises. I said he knew very well that one of us would have to sit up and wake the courier, and I added that we were having trouble enough to take care of ourselves on this climb without having to take care of a courier besides. During breakfast our spirits came up a little, since we found by this guide-book that in the hotels on the summit the tourist is not left to trust to luck for his sunrise, but is roused betimes by a man who goes through the halls with a great alpine horn blowing blasts that would raise the dead. And there was another consoling thing. The guide-book said that up there on the summit the guests did not wait to dress much, but seized a red bed-blanket and sailed out arrayed like an Indian. This was good. This would be romantic. Two hundred and fifty people grouped on the windy summit, with their hair flying and their red blankets flapping, in the solemn presence of the coming sun, would be a striking and memorable spectacle. So it was good luck, not ill luck, that we had missed those other sunrises. We were informed by the guide-book that we were now three thousand two hundred and twenty-eight feet above the level of the lake. Therefore full two-thirds of our journey had been accomplished. We got away at a quarter past four p.m., a hundred yards above the hotel the railway divided. One track went straight up the steep hill, the other one turned square off to the right with a very slight grade. We took the latter, and followed it more than a mile, turned a rocky corner, and came in sight of a handsome new hotel. If we had gone on, we should have arrived at the summit, but Harris preferred to ask a lot of questions, as usual, of a man who didn't know anything, and he told us to go back and follow the other route. We did so. We could ill afford this loss of time. We climbed and climbed, and we kept on climbing. We reached about forty summits, but there was always another one just ahead. It came on to rain, and it rained in dead earnest. We were soaked through, and it was bitter cold. Next a smoky fog of clouds covered the whole region densely, and we took to the railway ties to keep from getting lost. Sometimes we slopped along in a narrow path on the left-hand side of the track, but by and by, when the fog blew aside a little, and we saw that we were treading the rampart of a precipice, and that our left elbows were projecting over a perfectly boundless and bottomless vacancy, we gasped and jumped for the ties again. The night shut down, dark and drizzly and cold. About eight in the evening the fog lifted and showed us a well-worn path which led up a very steep rise to the left. We took it, and as soon as we had got far enough from the railway to render the finding it again an impossibility, the fog shut down on us once more. We were in a bleak, unsheltered place now, and had to trudge right along in order to keep warm, though we rather expected to go over a precipice sooner or later. About nine o'clock we made an important discovery, that we were not in any path. We groped around a while on our hands and knees, but we could not find it. So we sat down in the mud and the wet scant grass to wait. We were terrified into this by being suddenly confronted with a vast body which showed itself vaguely for an instant, and in the next instant was smothered in the fog again. It was really the hotel we were after, monstrously magnified by the fog. But we took it for the face of a precipice, and decided not to try to claw up it. We sat there an hour, with chattering teeth and quivering bodies, and quarreled over all sorts of trifles, but gave most of our attention to abusing each other for the stupidity of deserting the railway track. We sat with our backs to the precipice, because 
what little wind there was came from that quarter at some time or other the fog thinned a little we did not know when for we were facing the empty universe and the thinness could not show but at last harris happened to look around and there stood a huge dim spectral hotel where the precipice had been one could faintly discern the windows and chimneys and a dull blur of lights our first emotion was deep unutterable gratitude our next was a foolish rage born of the suspicion that possibly the hotel had been visible three-quarters of an hour while we sat there in those cold puddles quarreling yes it was the rigi kulm hotel the one that occupies the extreme summit and whose remote little sparkle of lights we had often seen glinting high aloft among the stars from our balcony away down yonder in lucerne the crusty portier and the crusty clerks gave us the surly reception which their kind deal out in prosperous times but by mollifying them with an extra display of obsequiousness and servility we finally got them to show us to the room which our boy had engaged for us we got into some dry clothing and while our supper was preparing we loafed forsakenly through a couple of vast cavernous drawing-rooms one of which had a stove in it this stove was in a corner and densely walled around with people we could not get near the fire so we moved at large in the arctic spaces among a multitude of people who sat silent smileless forlorn and shivering thinking what fools they were to come perhaps there were some americans and some germans but one could see that the great majority were english we lounged into an apartment where there was a great crowd to see what was going on it was a memento magazine the tourists were eagerly buying all sorts and styles of paper cutters marked souvenir of the rigi with handles made of the little curved horn of the ostensible chamois there were all manner of wooden goblets and such things similarly marked i was going to buy a paper cutter but i believed i could remember the cold comfort of the rigi kulm without it so i smothered the impulse supper warmed us and we went immediately to bed but first as mr baedeker requests all tourists to call his attention to any errors which they may find in his guide-books i dropped him a line to inform him he missed it by just about three days i had previously informed him of his mistake about the distance from allerheiligen to oppenau and had also informed the ordnance department of the german government of the same error in the imperial maps i will add here that i never got any answer to those letters or any thanks from either of those sources and what is still more discourteous these corrections have not been made either in the maps or the guide-books but i will write again when i get time for my letters may have miscarried we curled up in the clammy beds and went to sleep without rocking we were so sodden with fatigue that we never stirred nor turned over till the blooming blasts of the alpine horn aroused us it may well be imagined that we did not lose any time we snatched on a few odds and ends of clothing cocooned ourselves in the proper red blankets and plunged along the halls and out into the whistling wind bareheaded we saw a tall wooden scaffolding on the very peak of the summit a hundred yards away and made for it we rushed up the stairs to the top of the scaffolding and stood there above the vast outlying world with hair flying and ruddy blankets waving and cracking in the fierce breeze fifteen minutes too late at last said harris in a vexed voice the sun is clear above the horizon no matter i said it is a most magnificent spectacle and we will see it do the rest of its rising anyway in a moment we were deeply absorbed in the marvel before us and dead to everything else the great cloud-barred disk of the sun stood just above a limitless expanse of tossing whitecaps so to speak a billowy chaos of massy mountain domes and peaks draped in imperishable snow and flooded with an opaline glory of changing and dissolving splendors while through rifts in a black cloud-bank above the sun radiating lances of diamond dust shot to the zenith the cloven valleys of the lower world swam in a tinted mist which veiled the ruggedness of their crags and ribs and ragged forests and turned all the forbidding region into a soft and rich and sensuous paradise we could not speak we could hardly breathe we could only gaze in drunken ecstasy and drink it in presently harris exclaimed why nation it's 
going down perfectly true we had missed the morning hornblow and slept all day this was stupefying harris said look here the sun isn't the spectacle it's us stacked up here on top of this gallows in these idiotic blankets and two hundred and fifty well-dressed men and women down here gawking up at us and not caring a straw whether the sun rises or sets as long as they've got such a ridiculous spectacle as this to set down in their memorandum books they seem to be laughing their ribs loose and there's one girl there that appears to be going all to pieces i never saw such a man as you before i think you are the very last possibility in the way of an ass what have i done i answered with heat what have you done you've got up at half past seven o'clock in the evening to see the sunrise that's what you've done and have you done any better i'd like to know i always used to get up with a lark till i came under the petrifying influence of your turgid intellect you used to get up with a lark oh no doubt you'll get up with a hangman one of these days but you ought to be ashamed to be jawing here like this in a red blanket on a forty-foot scaffold on top of the alps and no end of people down here to boot this isn't any place for an exhibition of temper and so the customary quarrel went on when the sun was fairly down we slipped back to the hotel in the charitable glooming and went to bed again we had encountered the hornblower on the way and he had tried to collect compensation not only for announcing the sunset which we did see but for the sunrise which we had totally missed but we said no we only took our solar rations on the european plan pay for what you get he promised to make us hear his horn in the morning if we were alive end of chapter twenty eight